Can I uh, bring the committee um, back to the second panel we have this morning? Uh, we have Heather Gray, National Deaf Children's Society, uh, Rachel O'Neill, Murray House School of Education, Dr Roger Cameron, Child Protection Research Centre, and Catherine Finiston, British Association of Teachers of the Deaf Scotland. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, can I welcome all of you uh, this morning for attending? Um, we're just going to go uh, straight to questions, and can I begin the questions with Mark Griffin? Thanks, I wanted to go into questions um, around issues around teachers of the deaf in schools in Scotland. Just kick off a, around the, the shortage. We've heard in written evidence um, from Aberdeen City Council um, about the age profile of teachers of the deaf and generally being um, the majority of qualified staff are in their mid to late 50s and just to see whether you agree with that and what actually needs to be to be done now to to, to bridge that gap between um, boosting the numbers to an acceptable level as the ultimate ambition but actually just covering for the staff who are going to be leaving the service in the next 10 to 15 years. I, I trained um, 39 years ago and at that time the government had ring-fenced funding and it meant that all local authorities had the opportunity to appoint people to go on the training. Um, we did one full-time year's course, so people committed themselves to, to that year and became qualified. When the colleges and universities merged, um, they, they had to um, ensure that the modules were in line with the universities. So um, it was done as a modular course, I think initially eight modules over a period of up to five years. And circumstances change for people over, the, over five years. Um, you know, people get married, they have children, etc. Um, at that time, there was also an, a monetary incentive um, to do the course, it wasn't it wasn't a lot. I think it was in the region of two hundred and something pounds, but it was some incentive to do the, the qualification. Whereas now there is no incentive. What you find is teachers who um, are extremely interested in working in deaf education uh, um, apply for the courses. Some have to pay themselves. Some have to go to authorities and ask for funding. And if that's agreed, they continue with their job, the, the day job, and have to do the modules in addition to that. Um, so it, it can take quite a lot of time, and you don't get the same. It's only the people who really want to do the job that will commit themselves to that, but other people won't. So that it's, it's caused a national shortage. When you advertise for teachers of the deaf, qualified teachers of the deaf, um, you rarely get any applicants. Um, if you're lucky, you'll get one. I'd just like to talk about the course from the university point of view because I'm on the postgraduate diploma at Murray House and we have some people coming on the course quite late in life and we know that out there there are 30% of teachers <laughs> working with deaf children who are unqualified, so uh, local authorities are sometimes not sending us people. The people who come usually are highly motivated uh, one thing I would like to see is more deaf people coming forward, and that is quite a difficult thing because getting through to te becoming qualified as a teacher and then finding out about the possibilities once you're working in a local authority mean we don't often get, uh, for example, people with fluent sign language coming through. Um, and the age profile is quite old, that's true, but some authorities, I think uh, Falkirk is one of them, have made provision in advance by looking around for younger teachers and um, Fife is another council who's done this as well, looking out for very good teachers who they see in mainstream and sending those, and attracting those to a service and then sending them on, on the diploma. So it depends on the authority's perspective. Small authorities, rural authorities struggle, I think, most. Dr Cameron? I mean, I think some of the history about deaf teaching would be instructive at this point. Um, there are so few teachers because, because deaf people were only allowed to become um, deaf teachers very recently and it took a concerted amount of uh, lobbying to change the rules to allow deaf people to train at all to become teachers of the deaf and that's why we've got so few. 
Um, one of, the, one of the, the preconditions of becoming a qualified teacher was you had to be able to hear what was going on in the back of the classroom. Now, clearly, a lot of deaf people who were qualified and uh, intelligent enough to become teachers um, uh, weren't able to do so because of those rules. And I was one of those people. So I'm very thankful for that rule change that allowed me to qualify. But if we're looking at why there's such a dearth of deaf people as teachers of the deaf, um, that's the reason. And we need to make a concerted and proactive effort to build uh, that share of the teacher of the deaf um, uh, population uh, that are deaf to a much higher level. Thank you. Uh, Heather? Yeah, I mean, I suppose just to um, think again about those statistics. So there are 200 teachers uh, of the deaf in Scotland, according to the Consortium for Research and Deaf Education. And um, over a third uh, of those are, are unqualified. We've seen through the crowd report in the last few years quite a significant decline. So we know that over 50% of teachers of the deaf will retire in 10 to 15 years. And um, we also know that it is incredibly difficult um, to attract teachers um, because there isn't the incentives that, that Cathy spoke about. So the additional qualification does not bring with it um, any additional responsibility allowance, which I think is a major factor. But I do think we have a piece of work to do in terms of really promoting um, the work of Teachers of the Deaf and the huge impact that it has for children and how it can really transform children's lives too. So I think there is work to be done on really promoting um, the work of the Teachers um, of the Deaf um, and really starting to address this quite significant reduction that we're seeing and the difficulties in getting young people into the profession. I think it's absolutely right that we should be supporting and encouraging more deaf young people to become teachers of the deaf. And interestingly, we've got three of our young campaigners that are interested in becoming teachers of the deaf. And um, that, that is really important um, in terms of just giving young people the confidence um, to aspire to, to, to go into the profession. But we have work to do on um, promoting the profession and the impact that it can have and the transformational change it can make. Okay, just to pick up on a point um, Dr Cameron made about the qualifications of teachers of the deaf in particular um, with BSL, currently the, the standard is for BSL um, level one and I was struck by a comment Dr Cameron said that um, previously teachers weren't allowed to teach unless they could hear what was going on in the back of the classroom, but actually a teacher who only has BSL level one won't know what her, his or her own pupils will be signing in the classroom, so surely they weren't um, qualified to be in the, the classroom the classroom either, um, which seems to be a, a, a disparity. Um, what, what are your views on the level of BSL qualification that teachers have and what you think that could be the impact on pupils learning when some pupils themselves um, have a much um, higher uh, standard of BSL than the teachers themselves. Quite right, it's very unfair. It can have a serious uh, detrimental impact on their learning. If, if, if the language that's been used um, by the person who's instructing them isn't clear and they have a low skill level of British Sign Language, <clears throat> you know, simple mistakes can be made. I mean, if you think about even like the English term iron, you know, FE in the scientific world as, as an abbreviation. And we've seen examples of uh, people in the classroom using this sign for iron, as in the thing you iron your clothes with. Those are the kind of mistakes that are being made. And isolated deaf children in a mainstream environment aren't able to work out what that's supposed to be. It's crucial that the sign language is of such a, is of a, is fluent and of an, a, a, a standard that allows the deaf child to conceptualize what they're learning. And you, you talked, Mark, about level one, and we've done a lot of work on, uh, we, we do a lot of work at the, in, in the centre and at the university about developing science signs, but none of this, this uh, knowledge is being uh, transferred or, or is, it's not being replicated anywhere. And we're doing, there is such good examples of, of work going on, um, but what's clearly happening is if the sign language standard in the school is not clear and it's not good enough, then the kids have got no chance of learning. 
when we develop these science science together um, as a group, you're talking about a large group of uh, experts from the areas of science, linguistics, all those areas coming together and doing an awful lot of hard work just to get those concepts out in sign language. And what we're doing at the Scottish Century Centre is helping teachers teach, um, well, both deaf and hearing kids, because I'll give you an example if you wouldn't... Uh, if you think about the, the concepts mass... Anybody know? No. Does the committee know what mass is? Can you describe what mass or volume is? Okay. It's very difficult, isn't it? Just through the English word. And then when you think about gravity, okay, I'm sure you're all familiar with gravity. <laughs> right. So in sign language, look, the, the fist that I'm using here is the sign for mass, right? Everything's there, okay? Then you've got the gravity is the force that's acting on a, an, a, an object. So we have this sign, gravity, as in to come down to earth, okay, as Mary quite rightly showed with the pen, and if you put the two together, conceptually, visually, you have weight, and that is what weight is, as a concept, now you can see how visual, visually superior that is to trying to explain something in English, so not only are deaf kids going to benefit if we can use sign language with them, everybody's going to benefit, can you imagine trying to explain to a deaf child, without the teacher of the deaf who might not be there, in lip speaking, mass, volume, they're not going to get it. If you've got somebody who can sign, sign like that, then they're going to get the concepts immediately. So it's incredibly disappointing that we allow teachers of the deaf to qualify with only level one BSL. Rachel? Um, I quite agree, and I think it's a, a great science lesson, Audrey. The work of the Scottish Sensory Centre glossary is really important in in telling teachers of deaf children and communication support workers about new signs and concepts that they can use. The current advice that we have from the government, and it's the government advice, is level one. It's the same all over the UK, and it is no way near enough for people who use sign language. What's more, it keeps teachers of the deaf assuming, that regulation keeps people assuming that most deaf children are not going to use much sign in my submission and the submission from the British Deaf Association, we saw that actually there are large numbers of children, larger numbers in children using some sort of sign than other parts of the UK. And we know as well that teachers of the deaf, when they work with signing pupils, often have level two as what they regard as a good level. And if you talk to people in the deaf community, they are shocked by this because level six is regarded as a good level for people who are interpreting. Level three is seen as a minimum. When I say level three, I mean something like a higher in a language. Now, if any of you have got a higher in a modern language, could you teach in it? That is the level which we're seeing as the minimum level for teachers of deaf children. Now, that's what I say to my students. The, the government regulation says level one or more as appropriate. And that vagueness of the language, more as appropriate, is very unhelpful. So I feel that in Scotland we're in an interesting position now with the BSL bill, and I expect that guidance to be revised upwards. Whether it's revised for all teachers of deaf children or whether it's revised for those, children, those teachers working with signing students and the under fives, I don't know yet which way it will go. But I think we've got to remember that there, when we're talking about the word deaf, in the, UK, in, in the Scottish context, we're talking about two quite different groups of children. There is some overlap between them, and the signing pupils at the moment are not getting a good deal. Thank you. Heather? Can I just put this in, in, in a bit of perspective? 71% of um, peripatetic hearing impairment services in Scotland don't have any teachers qualified um, to BSL level 3 or beyond. And there are actually six services in Scotland um, where there are teachers with no qualifications in BSL. So I think that gives uh, a sense of the, the, the dimension really of, uh, of the challenge that, that, that we face just now too. We recently um, had a deaf learners conference and we had 21 BSL uh, users at that conference and they very strongly and clearly told us that they needed to have support which was far more fluent than uh, they currently had if they were going to succeed and to really achieve their potential and I think we really need to listen to the voices of those young people coming from that deaf learners conference um, and, and identify the need to, to do something about this but those are certainly the statistics just now um, in relation to BSL qualifications and teachers of the deaf in Scotland today. Thank you. Mark? Okay. Um, Colin Beattie. Thank you, Vera. Can I, can I start just with a, a little plea for 
plain English in some of the submissions. When I look at uh, a sentence like, part of, the, part of the solution is to transmogrify the educator from adhering to the sophisticated deficit model to one that generates empowerment of the pupil. I can barely get it out. <laughs> so, no, it's, it's, no one, it's no one here. It's no one here. From one of the first panel members, that, uh, you know, just for clarity, I don't, I don't think it was Andy here. <laughs> Anyway, I just, I just plea for plain English. Um, I was going to ask a little bit about uh, some of the suggestions that have been made in terms of uh, technology support uh, and how that could best be introduced to give the biggest impact on uh, pupils with uh, hearing difficulties or sensory impairment. What would, what would give the biggest hit? Um, well, um where, where I am in Falkirk, we have um, sound field systems which we're installing into all the primary one, two and three classes, um, into classes where we have children with unilateral losses, severe conductive losses, um, and we're finding that that's benefiting all of the children in the classroom. It's also benefiting the teacher because it helps um, the teacher's voice. You don't have to project it as loudly. And all of the children regardless of where they are in the class, get the same level of, of um, volume fr from the teacher. Um, there are also radio aid systems, modern radio aid systems, which are discreet. And uh, any of the children that we have that will benefit from a radio aid system will be supplied with one. But they, they cost about £1,000 each. And we've had, Batwad have had people um, writing and asking, how do we go about, they're a single teacher of the deaf um, in an authority, and they're saying, how do we go about getting a radio aid system and funding for that, or for a sound field system um, within our authority? And that it's very much at the, the hands of the education services whether or not there's funding for that. And is that the one major adaptation you think would make a, a huge impact? I think in, um, in technology, children also have um, laptops or... Um, but that, that would be the major one um, for us because it means that if they're wearing a radio aid system, regardless of where they are in the class, they will always hear the, the teacher's voice at the same volume and be tuned in to what, what is happening. Just taking an example of uh, what some local authorities do, um, for example, in, in, in my own Midlothian local authority, when, when schools are closed due to snow or inclement weather, uh, Children's homework is made available uh, through smartphones or through uh, the internet. How, 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 are, uh, how are sensory impaired children impacted by that? Does it disadvantage them hugely? Are there, are there adaptations that could be done to that to enable them to carry on with their uh, education? Children are able to now access um, support through GLOW. Um, and that can roll out to all of the children if the parents if the parents apply. Um, so there's no can disadvantage. Be signed up to that. So there isn't a disadvantage Good. there. And very often, if a child is ill or off, the parent will contact the school and ask for work to be sent home, and the teacher will do her best to present um, challenging, but. Um, homework which they're going to be able to cope with. If that's not possible, then the teacher of the deaf in our authority will go out and do a home visit and tutor the child. I mean, technology is obviously very important, but the, the, what underlies that will be a bilingual education that empowers um, deaf children. So if they're able to read, then they're going to be able to work from home um, the same as uh, any other child. If they're given language when they're born um, and they grow up uh, confident using sign language and English in a bilingual way, then they shouldn't have any problems. They should be able to access the written English just the same as their hearing peers. Um, and like their hearing peers, they shouldn't have to rely on technology for everything. Uh, sorry, sorry uh, Colin, sorry. Rachel and I wanted to come in. Yeah, I just wanted to say about technology. I don't think there's one technological hit that will solve the problem because, as Audrey says, the issue mainly is access to an early language. But 
in Scotland, what we need more of is educational geologists. We don't have enough. Those people can make the technological adjustments that are needed in local authorities, especially if they were able to work across many local authorities. Authorities are reluctant to employ one because perhaps they don't have enough work for one. So they seem, it seems an obvious job to give an essential service such as the SSC to work in many local authorities. Those people can fit um, radio aid systems. They can, they can advise on um, sound field systems. They can advise parents. They're very, very valuable. They're basically teachers of deaf children who've had additional training. And in Scotland, we need more of them. This is an example of a local authority that employs one? Yes, Fife employs one, um, and there, there, are, there is one freelance who's working across some local authorities in, in the West. And is that Falkirk it? has got one. they have been hard to recruit as well, hasn't it? Yes. Very difficult to recruit because there's so few of them. Do we know how many there are through Scotland? Five. Five, and that's a, a significant reduction um, over the last few mm -hmm. years. And often what we're seeing is um, if post holders leave, um, those posts are not being replaced. That certainly was the case in Ayrshire. And the Lothians. And in the Lothians. Yeah. So we're seeing um, a reduction. Mm -hmm. And you know, what, one of the points I was going to make was just that of um, actually there's no point in having the technology um, if we don't have the expertise to use it properly. And again, a very strong message coming through from the Deaf Learners Conference was the young people saying, actually, the teachers don't know how to use technology. And one of the young people, you know, gave this really um, funny incidence of where the um, teacher hadn't switched off the radio mic, and the kids heard the whole conversation that went on in the staff room. So it is it's a it's quite a fundamental point. But our young people are telling us that actually it's critical that our staff actually know um, how to use the technology that we've got. And this issue about the reduction in um, educational audiologists, we, we need to ensure that there's a solution. Ayrshire have um, skilled up one of their teachers of the deaf to be a specialist. There are ways to do this, but it's clearly an issue that not everybody has um, the skills and expertise to use the technology that we do have properly. Is there any indication that councils are increasingly sharing that resource? Or? No, the opposite, actually. Mm -hmm. I think at times of cuts, they're tending not to share. So previously, we had an educational audiologist based in Edinburgh who also worked with all the Lothians and that has been um, not replaced because the authorities couldn't agree and the service has definitely deteriorated as a result the, 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 the children used to have excellent service from that educational audiologist <coughs> right the way through from, from 0 to 18 Look, sorry. sorry can I say um, I think one of the other difficulties is that there isn't any training for educational audiologists in Scotland there isn't any of the universities that, that provide that. I think one other further point is there isn't actually any consistency between the audiologists that do exist in Scotland. So there isn't a job description for an educational audiologist. It's quite inconsistent. So, so you have skill level. Yeah. Well, the qualification is a guarantee. Sorry, Audrey. Oh, I mean, it does obviously make sense to have a better use of... of um, technology and also to centralise services across authorities and, and make good use you know, of, of resources and not only uh, hardware and software resources but, but the people resources and it, you know, rather than seeing authorities wasting money you know, um, trying to, to provide these services on their own it, it, it does, you know, an economy of scale has to be able to be leveraged Sorry, Rachel You Colin? Yes, uh, okay, before we move on, I'm going to just take a so short suspension at the moment for just a five minute break. If you don't mind, thank you. Okay, um, we'll just uh, move on now um, uh, with uh, Chick Brody. Thank you. Good morning. Um, in the papers that we got, there's a, a quote from the Scottish Council on Deafness. Uh, highlighting the importance of multi-agency information. Uh, the quote is, under the Universal Newborn Hearing Screening Programme, children are picked up in a hearing test that happens as part of health tests in the first six weeks. Now, we've heard uh, at the earlier session, in terms of vision impairment, that we have no uh, idea, really, as to... Uh, there is a spectrum, of course, but no idea of the actual numbers that are involved. Um, 
We're told that as far as uh, hearing is concerned, that screening is recorded within the NHS databases at a local level. But, but, our understanding is this information is not always shared effectively across the different services, potentially creating missed opportunities for early interventions and support for the children and families. Do you agree with that? I think that, you know, fundamentally we need to know how many uh, uh, children and we're dealing with uh, uh, for early intervention, for starting the language learning process, something crucial for a deaf baby, you know, to have access to a visual language really from as close to day one as we can get it. So it's very important. But I have, you know, other concerns about the newborn um, screening uh, test. You know, my personal experience when I had a baby myself, you know, we were given, the, because both my husband and I are deaf, we were, uh, the test was, was administered the next day. And I, I knew she was kind of hearing instinctively. I thought everything was going to be fine. And straight away the person uh, said, oh, no, we're going to refer your baby straight away to a speech and language therapist, even though they're perfectly hearing. Which I thought, well, hang on a second. You don't know my background. You don't know who I am. I'm, I'm from a hearing family. I grew up with a hearing family myself. You know, my, my daughter, who's now 10, uh, is, is fluently bilingual, by the way, so none of those fears. Uh, she speaks just as clearly as everybody else. So I can imagine what um, their attitude is going to be like with hearing parents who have a deaf baby, the, the, the other way around. You know, because, I mean, I was upset. I mean, my daughter had just been born. It's the day after, you know, and I, I put myself into the hearing um, parents' um, position. And I think, you know, the, you know, the, the health the health services and settings need to be, know how to work with the social side of things, having positive role models, getting deaf adults in there, not to have this negative attitude of, oh dear, your child's deaf, what, and seeing it as a necessarily negative thing. But, you know, the health services do need to be plugged in, but they also need to be uh, making parents aware of all the different life possibilities and all the different avenues that their deaf child um, can undertake and and to know that, that deaf people do regularly strive for and achieve their dreams in, in many walks of life. May, may, I ask, may I ask, in terms of that's very helpful, but um, what I suppose the most important people, people uh, that, that we've talked about, teachers are very important, uh, the curriculum is very important, the methods are very important, but at the end of the day, the parents are absolutely critical from day one. I mean, what measures would you um, support in terms of improvements in multi-agency working to support parents you know, from day one and in the early years? Rachel. I'd just like to refer you to the Scottish Sensory Centre Early Years Standards, which were developed by a group of practitioners and parents in 2011. And they set out ways that the agencies can work together, seeing the parents at the centre of the team. And... And that attitude about putting the parents at the centre is quite difficult for some agencies to realise. We know we've got the benefit of newborn screening in Scotland and we've got good paediatric standards, but these standards are not statutory. Education Scotland does not assess with them at all and doesn't actually assess early years services. We know many of those early years services are very, very successful. Angus, for example, has got a very successful service. It's a small authority, but they have got age-appropriate language for all deaf children who have been or nearest to age-appropriate from the age that screening started. And as they go on more and more, what they're not getting from newborn screening is mildly deaf children. They are picked up, people who've got mild, children who've got mild deafness, but they're not referred straight away. So those sorts of things could be improved a great deal. These guidelines could be made statutory, Education Scotland, HMIE could inspect them. Um, also, if you look at the, um, the BDA recommendations about an early years sign intensive environment, that could also be very useful for establishing bilingual education for, those, for many deaf children because it's an advantage for everybody to have a bilingual experience. And I like the way they suggested about um, having a resource space with a reasonable number of deaf children and deaf adults signing or hearing adults who can sign very fluently. Having a, a fluent language before you have an implant or having exposure to a fluent language before you have an implant actually helps you map those um, signs that you know onto spoken English very well. Deaf children from deaf families actually do best out of any group 
um, when they have an implant because they already have a language before. So early exposure to two languages is a good thing, but it's very hard to organise. And I, that's why I quite like the VDA's response there, where they were looking in practical detail about how uh, agencies and authorities could cooperate to make that happen. Uh, so I think those are the two steps that I would suggest. Implement these, make them something which HMIE can inspect. And remember the parents at the centre and uh, establish early years bilingual environments. Good. Hi, can I just say that we did have um, two pilots for um, local record um, of deaf children in both uh, Lothian and Tayside, which was set up um, on the back of universal newborn screening and, and which was all about sharing information and making sure uh, that services were working together. One of the things that, that we've called for is that we have a national rollout of that but it, because it creates that environment where services are working together and we're using the information from universal newborn screening to make sure that um, professionals and services are working together. The other thing that um, I would say is that what's critical for parents re remembering that 90% um, of parents are hearing um, who have a deaf child uh, is the role that the third sector can play. Um, all the things that, um, that, that around about deaf role models, making sure that parents have impartial advice, um, making sure that there's someone there to navigate them through what can be a really challenging and, and difficult time. Um, GERFEC provides the perfect framework for that, um, but we need, to, we need to make sure that we're progressing in terms of those GERFEC pathways and that services are truly working together and that parents have got that very practical, impartial advice from other parents our family support service covers every authority in Scotland. Our family support workers are parents of deaf children. Um, that kind of practical um, emotional support is really, really important too. So I think there are solutions there and there are things that we know and have learned from the past that we can roll out um, to improve how services work together and how we can make sure that within that pathway parents get support from other parents. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Mary. Supplementary on that point, and I'm grateful to you for raising it. Um, if, uh, paragraph 5.1 in the National uh, Deaf Children's uh, Evidence, um, despite the introduction of the Universal Newborn Health Screening in 2005, the Scottish Government has not yet published any guidance in terms of post-diagnostic and subsequent early year support uh, for children and families, resulting in considerable implications for long-term education and well-being outcomes. So I hear what uh, Rachel O'Neill mentioned about uh, coming together, but why has it taken 10 years for the government to produce nothing after the introduction of this universal newborn health screening in 2005? We, we have got standards. No, but the we don't government have hasn't published. That's, That's right. what I'm talking about. Yeah. I think probably it might have been... Sorry, do you want to reply? I think it might have been because newborn screening was seen in a very health-orientated way. And there are actually paediatric standards, which are very good, but they don't involve what happens next, which is talking to a teacher, talking to language role models. It's, it, the implementation of the screening has been seen almost entirely as a health issue. It's obviously not. So when you say has not published guidance, and to, you know, I won't repeat what I've said, did you expect them to publish guidance? That's what I'm reading into it. Or does the guidance not matter? No, I think That's guidance, what I'm not understanding. I think the guidance is absolutely critical. and I think So why hasn't it been done for 10 years? I think for the reasons that Rachel's um, describing in terms of health. Sorry, Audrey. Well, I was just going to say, um, <coughs> nobody's listening to deaf people? Perhaps is the reason nobody's listening well, to us. I think we are listening today. I did pick up the. It was Audrey that uh, started on that point, and to be fair, I have picked that up. <laughs> oh no! Uh, the inference was that the government hasn't been listening I for ten years. Yes, but, but all I'm asking, convener, is the government's guidance in terms of early year support and and uh, information is it critical going forward in terms of support? attainment, etc., for deaf children. Rachel? Um, I'd like to discuss this, because I think it is critical. 
in some local authorities in Scotland, there are um, not enough teachers of the deaf or not enough qualified teachers of the deaf. And occasionally, you, well, rather regularly, actually, you hear about children who are languageless at five or six, which is far too late. They are referred at birth, but perhaps they might be getting... I have heard examples quite recently of, of uh, somebody being aided at three and a half and they've been referred at birth. Nothing much had happened in the meantime. So the, the reason why we need these standards is because there is inconsistency between authorities. And some authorities have got very proactive staff, go on extra courses, read a lot, understand the early monitoring protocol which we have, which is English materials about the development of early sign and speech, and they're implementing them, they're monitoring very carefully. Other authorities say to me, I've heard one person say to me, what is the monitoring protocol? Now that is just shocking. I mean, those children haven't got a chance. Languageless children should not exist. But unfortunately, in, 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 in deaf world, we meet languageless children. Of course they're not going to achieve academically. Uh, one of the problems is languageless children often exist in rural areas and they're not allowed to get to a place where they can see sign language used. Yes, Audrey. And I'd have to say quite, it's a little bit sad. I mean, I've, I've met languageless people who, are, who don't live in the rural area, you know, who are in, uh, you know, yeah. urban areas. And, it's, and it does come back to the fact that the teachers and the support staff that they meet don't know how to sign. Their parents don't know how to sign to a significant standard. So what chance do they have, in a sense? But I wouldn't mind going back just quickly to the newborn screening um, issue. Um, there, ha there has been some research from Leeds. I'm sorry, I can't remember the name of the researcher, about the emotional, uh, at emotional attachment with baby. And because of the attitude of health professionals um, on, uh, at the point of diagnosis, um, it doesn't allow um, either the mother or the father uh, to really effectively bond with their child and, and celebrate, you know. I mean, everybody's always after the perfect healthy baby, is what we're told. Um, but, and the screening obviously has an advantage because it picks these things up early. But what it does, of course, is it can run the risk of the parents detaching from the child, starting to feel guilty um, immediately about that. Um, and no matter what we... Uh, think babies pick up on that they pick up on that quite clearly so we should be straight away providing a positive environment for those parents saying look you know here's a, here's a language that you can access that your child can access straight away you know and before um the newborn screening uh, program ironically parents had that time to bond with their child my parents didn't know that i was deaf until i was nine months old um, but that bond and the love had already been established. That affirmation uh, for me as a human being had already been made. I wasn't seen as deficient or disabled immediately. So a lot more has got to be done in that area um, uh, to give parents this positive experience rather than, a, oh dear, your child's deaf and everything's negative. Yeah? And, and, and to see it as something that necessarily needs to be repaired. Thank you. Thank you. Mary, do you want to move on to... Yes, only one question. That's fine, OK. My questions were actually on uh, data collection and uh, attainment. But uh, uh, So I'll, I'll just go to, to one question, and uh, that is um, our briefing from the Parliament today looks at positive destinations uh, for school leavers with a hearing impairment. So if I look at those with uh, no additional support needs, it's 917 and with a hearing impairment, 89.4, which on paper doesn't look too bad. If I just go to further education, with uh, no additional support needs, the follow-up destination is 22.5, and, and with a hearing impairment, 41. Now, as an economist, I know that below these figures there are many stories to tell, but if you'll forgive me, taking a a rough glance at these figures, they look quite good. Um, I find it hard to believe that that's the full story, and I would perhaps ask you if, if, if uh, positive destinations, entry into further education, I have to say higher education is uh, about half uh, for people with a hearing impairment, impairment. But, you know, behind these figures, these figures look quite good. Behind the figures, are there any concerns you would like to raise with us today? Okay, 
I would, yes. I think you're right to pick out about the difference between further education and higher education. A larger proportion of children go, deaf children go on to further education rather than higher. It's pr 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 practically reversed. Uh, which the reason is because of the largely because of the English level, and the research that we've done recently at the University of Edinburgh, the achievements of um, the Nuffield Foundation uh, funded research about the achievements of deaf pupils in Scotland showed that there were two areas of concern, and I, I showed them in the uh, graph that I put in my submission, which was. Um, The English results at S4, actually, no, you can't see this, but S4. Um, S4, you, you've got all the levels of deafness category from people with cochlear implants to mildly deaf, profoundly deaf, severely deaf, deaf, performing much worse at S4 in English. And then when you get the high flyers, those who you'd expect to be going to university, um, getting level five when they're in S4, um, again, drastically different results. I mean, all the different categories of deafness performing much worse. Now, this is because, it must be because of early language experience and also the experience they have right the way through school in support and access to language in the curriculum. So, um, data collection is very important. The other group that I would want to concentrate on is those who leave school with very low-level qualifications or no, level, no qualifications, which about, is about 16%, and much, much higher with, with a level three SEQF qualification, you really can't get onto a very decent college course. So that group of children need much more examination. Who are they? And I expect that many of them are from impoverished backgrounds, which we unfortunately have come to expect in the UK. And many of them would also be probably the languageless children that I talked about before. And many of them perhaps have been unfortunate enough to grow up in areas where they didn't have access to sign language and were profoundly deaf or they didn't have very good acoustic conditions. So th that group of children who achieve poorly, getting SCQF level three and below when they leave school, need more study. And we need to find out who they are and we need to put targets in, not when they're 16, that's far too late. We need the early years environment. And I would say mildly deaf children, as much as profoundly deaf children, need that support early on. I, I am concerned in Scotland at the moment about the speech and language therapy cuts which seem to be very widespread. And I think that the whole range of deaf children in the early years needs extra support, much better support from multi-agency groups. Thank you. Audrey? I think just to add to what Rachel was saying about the... the there is a need for um, support, but there is also a desperate need for research about what's actually going on in the classroom. When we have got successful learners, why are they successful? What's going on with them? You know, we talk about not enough communication support workers, not enough teachers of the deaf, not enough qualified people there. That's fine, but we do need to find out what's going on in the classrooms today, what the reality is. In you know, because what I suspect we're often finding is mainstream uh, teachers with one deaf child in their class and perhaps having a teacher of the deaf or a communication support worker, a CSW, coming in for um, a certain amount of time a week and running what is essentially a macro class within the larger class. So the classroom teacher isn't directly teaching the deaf child. They're, they're devolving that responsibility to someone else who may not be qualified to deliver that education. You know, and put it, I mean, I've seen this in evidence myself. You know, th there's no way you can expect a child to behave normally in that situation. Of course they're going to be disruptive. They're going to be distracted. They're going to look out the window. They're not going to be paying attention because they're detached from the rest of the class. Um, and they're existing within this macro environment. So there's no follow-up from the teacher directly. Um, and they're not enjoying uh, anywhere near uh, the level of access to education that all the other uh, kids are. So this inclusive education is actually exclusive. And I've been following four deaf children to try and, and uh, uh, ask them why they don't get involved in asking the teacher questions. Um, that interactive part of, of, of someone's education experience is one of the most crucial uh, parts of their learning. Um, and we've identified that often the, the classroom teachers, um, when they ask a question to the class, um, you know, as we've seen on the panel today, hearing people can put up their hands a lot faster. 
you know? And it's actually 1.2 seconds is all you've got on average before the first kid's hand goes up. So when you've got a communication support worker who isn't qualified, um, how are they supposed to keep the deaf child up to speed or a teacher of the deaf even? You know, I've seen teachers of the deaf, I've seen one of them saying, oh, don't worry about it, I'll write it down for you later, I'll tell you later. So that's not, they don't stand a chance and therefore the, ch the children don't stand a chance and that's why they're not getting anything out of this supposedly inclusive what would be better is if we had uh, children in, 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 in smaller group environments interacting directly with a teacher that was qualified and skilled in the necessary language and cultural aspects to deal with them, not education through a third party. So that deaf children are involved in class discussions, involved in debates, they know what's going on in the whole classroom and they're not feeling isolated as they currently are. You know, we're, we, we talk about a holistic education experience uh, and, and life skills and habilitation skills, but we're, we're falling woefully short on all of those uh, uh, measure, measurements when it comes to deaf children. And the first step uh, to improving that is to have a look at what's actually going on in the classrooms today. And we don't have an idea. We don't have a picture of that yet. It wouldn't be acceptable. I mean, would you take it if it was your child? Would you accept that education for your child? You know, a lot of the communication support workers that are providing the, the access, they don't have subject knowledge um, um, and they don't have fundamentally and crucially the language skills to perform their job. So, I mean, how could you try, how can you interpret physics if you can barely sign? We need to look at what's going on in the classrooms today. Thank you. Good. Can I just say this is one of the reasons why um, NDCS have been uh, calling on an aspect review um, of deaf education um, because what we've seen and what has come through um, our research um, are pockets of excellent practice where this is done exceptionally well in Scotland and other areas where it's incredibly poor. But because peripatetic teachers of the deaf who largely the teachers supporting young people in the mainstream are not routinely inspected, we do not have a national picture um, of the quality uh, of support that's going in. And we have repeatedly, and I'll repeat it again today, um, said we believe very strongly that what we now need is a full aspect review of deaf education so that we can identify where practice is really good and really learn from it and share that best practice and really get to grips with where it is just not working well. Okay, thank you. Um, Siobhan McMahon. Thank you. Um, I want to go on and talk about the um, independence of, of people who are at school and, and how we get that and I had asked some questions about the habilitation skills um, in the first panel which I will do but I wanted to start um, with Dr Cameron's evidence because um, Dr Cameron you finished with the sentence uh, in, in the last paragraph what we need is a system for gathering data on the achievements of deaf pupils I was wondering what that system would look like and also what do you believe the achievements would be I, well, I feel that the the achievements, you know, um, would, in Scotland would be woefully bad and inadequate. I think that's what the picture would be. I had to go to England myself to get a decent education, so I had to travel from Scotland. To, I had to go down there. But but what, when you talk about that system, what we need to do is is uh, take in the whole picture, not just the child's understanding of a subject. Yeah, um, you, you, you know, you talk about confidence, uh, habilitation skills, independent skills all that stuff that we see in the curriculum for excellence, it's simply not happening for deaf children. Um, we do have some isolated individual success stories, but it's, it's, no, it's by no means um, uh, predictive. Um, and often what we see is in that situation that there's been extra payments made either by the family or the school or somewhere to get extra communication support for that child. So it comes down to money. So, I mean, I... I mean, if it was a hearing child not receiving the same standard of education as their peers, I mean, we, we, we would have parents, parents would be outraged. But we seem to find it acceptable for deaf children. Um, and and that, I think that's the, 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 the nub of the question. So, 
uh, I think then it comes on to my next questions then about um, to what extent um, habilitation skills are being provided across the country. Do we know that, or um, has anyone got an idea of who's who's doing more? If it's in mainstream schools, if it's in independent schools, if it's in um, special schools, have we got any idea across the country as to what's happening? Shall I answer that one? Yes. Um, I'm suppose in, in my job, I'm lucky that I am able to visit a lot of schools and also do placement visits and um, read placement files. So in some way, I have got an idea. I'm not saying it's a complete picture. Uh, there are many really good things happening in um, supporting. We don't usually use the term habilitation in deaf education, but I know what you mean. In visual impairment terms, it's things like mobility training and things like that. In terms of deaf education... It, well, I suppose independence and resilience and confidence. Okay. And I think, I mean, I think the NDCS has done some very good work in this area. And the, when I look at s children who are coming to events, for example, which sometimes have events at the Scottish Sensory Centre for Pupils, the, the places where there is a resource-based school, I, saw, I see much more confidence. And I see in some areas of, the, of Scotland, deaf studies being a, a subject in itself. And I don't mean just big D deaf studies, only focusing on sign language, but talking about the experience of being deaf and having the chance to reflect on that experience and seeing yourself as a potential deaf adult who is likely to perhaps sometimes want to use sign, sometimes want to use speech in different circumstances, understanding the situation of deaf people and understanding what they need to do to make hearing people work better with them. That sort of self-confidence assertiveness training is done some, in some places and you can see the results when you get groups of deaf children together. I must say that Falkirk is one of those places where I've seen deaf students being very confident and talk out and, and be aware about who they are. And you've got deaf adults in that school, haven't you? So I think the proof is in the pudding there. I think that, 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 that helps a great deal, you know, because a lot of deaf children, I mean, amazingly think that they're going to become hearing when they grow up. They still walk around with that fallacy because they never meet a deaf adult throughout their whole childhood. Have, we have a deaf sign language tutor, but we often have um, lots of our uh, former pupils coming back and talking to the children and being involved with what they're doing. Any time we have a deaf adult in the school, we always invite them down right to the, the primary classes to make sure that they are aware. We do surveys on um, with the children, the very young pr primary children, asking, um, are you deaf or are you hearing? What do you think that person is? Are they deaf? Are they hearing? How do they communicate? Do they wear hearing aids? Um, and so on. So it, it is, it's a much more natural environment. And the children that come back um, praise the education that they've had in Windsor Park because we do care very much about each individual child's needs and try and address those needs as best we can. Yes, sorry. So, I mean, what we're seeing here is a, a clear need for an environment where, uh, you know, a deaf-friendly environment, a signing environment, not an environment that isolates the child. Okay, thank you very much. Um, Liam MacArthur. Thank you. Very much. I was interested, uh, Dr. Cameron, you made a comment that echoed, I think, what Dominic Everett said in the previous panel about the scope within Curriculum for Excellence to, to address some of these things. Uh, his concern was then that there wasn't kind of space and capacity within the system to allow some of the habilitation to take place. I wonder if similar issues arise in relation to the, the independence and resilience that you were talking about, uh, Rachel. And, and therefore, as we got onto a discussion about whether or not the presumption of mainstreaming was actually the way in which it was implemented and interpreted was actually working against the, the interests of, in, in, in the previous discussion, those with um, sight impairments and whether this, there's a similar issue in relation to those with hearing impairment. I, I think it would say that uh, you'd say that mainstreaming isn't working at all in that regard. Now, you can see why wanting to include deaf people in society sounds like a great thing. It doesn't sound like a bad thing at all in theory. But the actual experience is that they're becoming more isolated. They're more vulnerable in the mainstream than they ever have been before. And 
you know, teachers of the deaf might be able to visit, what, once a week? In some cases, once a month, you know, an hour a day. So what are the kids doing the rest of the time in school? What's happening all the other hours? If you've got a deaf resource center or a base within a larger school where you've got that critical mass to enable confidence, independence, um, I think that we can get through all of the curriculum for excellence. It, in the, there shouldn't be any barriers to learning if we provide the right learning environment. Deaf kids, you, you know, I've met deaf people who know a number of languages. There's no reason deaf people can't even learn French, Japanese, physics, any subject. Um, if the language base is there, if the education is accessible, then they can achieve on a par with their hearing peers. But to drop them in the mainstream um, with no support or, or inadequate support is, is you know, it, well, it's, it's, sh it's shameful. And, and one, one doesn't like to think about the mental health implications that must arise from uh, the anxiety these young people must feel going through that experience. And deafness is not a learning disability. That's, and, and that's an important point to bear in mind. I, I, mean, I was going to say that the visit to Winter Park School was, was evidence that where it works, it can work extremely well and therefore um, I suppose the question is um, does that give us confidence that we should be able to make that work across the piece perhaps by concentrating resource um, in, in, in some respects um, or will we need to tailor things in an urban setting compared to a rural setting? I mean, I, I, I had a previous panel talk about the, the, the lack of provision at all in my own constituency in Orkney, and that comes as no surprise to me. Um, recruitment can present um, real difficulties in some, uh, in some rural areas. So is, is there a danger that we try to fix this with a, a sort of one-size-fits-all and, and, and end up coming up with, with solutions that really aren't going to work in, in different parts of the country? Yeah, I'm really glad you asked that question. I caught it on the monitor downstairs, actually, as you were asking it to the previous panel. And I think the standards in Scotland's Schools Act leading to the presumption of mainstreaming does some deaf children a real disservice because of the fact that they can risk falling into this category of language lists. And also, as Audrey has explained very clearly about mental health implications of being different, isolated and not involved in the classroom. So uh, the research that we did suggested that it would benefit local authorities if they cooperated and set up resource-based schools where you have a peer group. Um, and this can work for children who sign as well as who, children who use speech. I mean, DL High School is a very good example of a successful resource-based school where children achieve. And if you notice, DL is in the top 50 secondary schools for Scotland, according to the Herald's League table, and it's got more than you'd expect children from deprived backgrounds, and the, the success rate is good. Um, having a, a mass of children... I mean, I don't necessarily think that it's good that DL only uses speech because I can't see nowadays why we need to just have that approach. But the fact is, it's an achieving school. It's a school where parents want their children to go. They're very happy when the deaf, um, parents of deaf children are very happy when the children get into DL. They achieve well. And resource-based schools are a good idea. Obviously, easier to work out in um, Central Belt than in the rest of Scotland. But rural authorities could collaborate and did in the past collaborate. For example, Aberdeenshire used to send children into Aberdeen City to the, where they have a school. They don't anymore. That's where you have a risk, I think, and it's perfectly possible for those local authorities to collaborate more. And we have to consider as part of that boarding, you know, boarding schools. We do have, you know, uh, children still do go to a school. Mary Hare, notably in England, is a school that they go to very successfully. They're, they're usually weekend boarders, so they go home at the weekend. But I know, I mean, some people find it very heartbreaking, you know, in today's context, you know, and, and uh, you know, to being away from your parents. But I'm actually very grateful to my parents for taking that brave step and providing me with the education that I required. And if they hadn't have done that at the time and hadn't made that move, I certainly wouldn't have got my doctorate and I wouldn't be sitting here in front of you. Perhaps the Harry Potter books have made boarding more attractive uh, to, to 21st century parents. I don't know, but... Um, that's what my experience was like, yeah. Being, <laughs> that's what my school was like, being yes. at Hogwarts. Yeah, except we're all deaf. <laughs> but still magical. 
Can I um, can I thank the panel um, for coming along this morning um, and giving up your time to come and uh, speak to us and give us your evidence? Um, it's been very helpful. This is obviously the start of a, a short inquiry into um, sensory impairment to go along with the bigger inquiry on attainment that we're doing, um, and also I think fits very well in some, into some of the work we've done with Mark Griffin's bill on uh, BSL. So I think, uh, once again, can I thank you very much, and can I also uh, just thank Andy Carmichael very much for all his efforts, though yeah, yeah. it's uh, um, it's through him that we'd, obviously we can we can do this so well. So thanks very much, Andy, and, I, and thank you.